you're going to have to learn how to live um, in the hard times. But but it was done for a lot of years. You know, people survived. Can I just make this? I mean, you bring up a very good point, which is that kids do what they see us doing, and uh, what they see. You're right. Is absolute materialism, and the sense that um, you know you want the biggest car and you want the big and and. As adults, we have gotten away from it. So there's no reason to think that the kids would, would be any different. That um, the kind of things that they see on TV, the kind of things that they are constantly bombarded with in film and TV, are images that, um, that glorify things that it seems to me are values that are not things that are going to help us sustain ourselves and, um, in any community that we live in. So the question is going to be also how we as adults begin to police ourselves. because the, the votes aren't in them yet, so I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, get a real, I get real reticent about black male schools because I think that the kind of ch chauvinism, sexism that kind of comes out is very worrisome to me, and particularly in the midst of some of the rap that comes out with bitches and whores and stuff that you, um, I mean, one of the things when I talk on campus is that I tell sisters, you know, you, can, you should not put up with this. This is ridiculous. You know, this is dehumanizing that we would not allow white people to say this to us. <laughs> now, why are, you, why are you allowing brothers to say this? Um, and so, and the fact that women also do it is ridiculous to me, you know? I mean, we, but it, that's a whole other thing. That's, that's another lecture. Okay, so um, I guess what I'm, what I think about is, um, oh, no, what did you just tell me? I was, like, I was going off somewhere else, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, so, so that's what worries me with that. Um, but I do think that there has to be a way that we become more inclusive in our education. I mean, it is true that you can go through, that it has not changed that much from what I was talking about in terms of that reconstruction chapter in, in the textbook. Um, that you really, most schools, because I do teacher training now, are round eyes on the prize and the use of it um, in terms of um, informing the curriculum. And what you find is that most schools start our history here as African Americans with slavery. Now, what happens is that it, distorts the white student's view of black people, but it also distorts the black people's view. So it automatically builds in a superiority piece within the white culture and an inferiority piece within the black culture. Um, and that, yeah, they need to know about Timbuktu. They need to know about um, you know, the amazing empires that were going on in Ghana. They need to know that we were something as a people before we ever got to these shores, that we, were not, we did not start in chains. And, um, and that goes all the way through so that, um, to me, people should not just be hearing about Sean O'Casey or Just or Shakespeare or whatever, um, but they should also be hearing about Chinua Achebe in Africa. They should also be hearing about um, all the wonderful Native American and Latino and Asian. There, there, there should be the sense that we are valuing everybody's culture and that we can all learn from it and that if you don't do that, then you deny to us the things that make us whole. And so. Um, I mean, I'm trying to remember if there's a very famous, um, a very famous historian, older historian, who's very much about, uh, against, Afri uh, against um, um, what he calls Afrocentric, um, which when you talk to him, because we had him at an advisor's meeting, and if I could remember his name, you'd all know who it was. Um, and his thing, so, so at one point, one of our producers said, well, are you saying then that it did not, it doesn't, um, engender a certain pride in Greek children to know about the Greco-Roman Empire. And he said, no, no, it has no difference. It makes no difference to them. But of course it does. And it's, it, it does something to those of us who are not Greek or Roman um, or Italian or whatever um, to know about the greatness of that because it puts them, if that's all you're hearing about, and you're not hearing about your own greatness, then what does that mean in terms of how you view those people and don't view your others? And I guess the other thing that has begun, that I begin to under, I've begun to understand is a sense that nothing is intrinsically good. Right? I mean, that's one of the things that I guess came out during that whole thing about, you know, you do big afros and you do this and that, that there's nothing in the way that I understood it intrinsically good about blonde hair. Now, this was amazing to me. 
because I came up with all these advertisements. You know, this is before Dar Barbie, because I'm old. But I mean, everybody had little white houses with, with long, you know, um, that horrible um, straw-like blonde hair and stuff. Because it was assumed that intrinsic to blonde hair was goodness and value and worth and stuff. And so it was a whole turnaround to me when we went through like the Black Power period that said, oh, wait a minute, throws are good too. Black hair is good. You know, this is good. That was an opening of my eyes in the same way that we have to do it with the literature, with the culture, with the, you know, that we all need to see other cultures without getting this value on just one, which tends to be Eurocentric. And how do you begin to do that? And I guess what I'm saying to finally answer your question is that, um, yes, I would prefer that some of that pride be put in through regular school courses so that everybody could benefit. But my problem is that we're now in 1994 and it still hasn't happened and I'm not sure how you begin to get that. And if you can't get that, then somehow we have as, a, as, as a people have got to figure out how we get that. And maybe that comes from talking to ourselves. I don't know. I think it's a shame, but I, don't, I, I guess I don't want to not have it for my community, hoping that some way, somehow, in a regular public education, everybody's going to get it. I don't know. I still have one minute, so I know oh, the moderator is not going to ask a question, but I'm going to anyway. <laughs> We've been talking a lot, I think today now and today, about women who've been active in movements, and I think we've talked quite a bit about women who are active in movements within their culture. And my question is, and I, I've heard the answer, I think I probably don't want to ask anyway, if um, you see issues, areas, benefits where a woman could and might benefit from working together across cultures. I, I think they always have. You know, they always have. And um, uh, probably education is the most impacting area uh, for any minority culture. And so I think when, um, you know, when, back what Judy was just saying, we, we have the opportunity to view some of that um, where you have um, like an all-black school, all we have, for the most part, all Indian uh, students in our reservation schools, and maybe you have like 99.6% Lakota children. So you've got maybe two or three uh, non-Indian students in each school. And so we have um, the opportunity to deal with that, but the most influential people coming in are people from other cultures uh, that will come in and show our children that uh, we've had Aborigine dancers come in from Australia. We've had um, uh, German uh, folk dancers come in and people like that, you know. And it's so important for our kids to share that and for those people also to come into our culture and see who we are. And, and it's the women usually because first of all we have a lot of single parents um, that are women, that have the children, that are bringing them in. And it's the women who are getting acquainted, and the, the women that are bridging those cultural uh, gaps there and inviting the people into their own homes and, and um, the other people inviting the women over to their countries. You know? So I think that happens even now, that, that there's that cult, cross-cultural connection. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? <coughs> Talk up a little bit loud. I think part of it is that we have to be one of those who control the image. So we've got to start making films, you know. I mean, one of the things that was wonderful about, about Eyes on the Prize is that you had a lot of black female filmmakers who came out of that. Um, that you will find the same thing with the new series that we're, we're coming up with. That you begin to, to yourself decide that you're going to start making films to challenge some of those images. Now, it's hard because um, for, there's a whole spate of them that are only controlled by the ones you're talking about, black male fem uh, filmmakers. Um, but I think we have to figure out also the vehicles that we use. And um, 
And part of it is just going through some of the things that will allow us to be equipped and give us the skills to do that. So the colleges, the communications courses, the journalism courses, the things. Um, because we treat t topics differently. And I think that's probably one of the only ways that it'll work is if we begin to control some of the vehicles. With that, I'd like to thank everybody. I think we're back to this morning where John Hammond said power is good. <laughs>